So welcome back for this afternoon's uh, panel, and again, wonderfully led by Lee Haffrey, and he will introduce our panelists. We, I want to say again, thank you to the Weatherhead Center and to Salada for uh, co-sponsoring this with Class Act HR 73. Uh, we had a wonderful morning, and expect lots more now. So thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And indeed, I, I hope that this second of our two panels will continue on the conversation we had this morning. Uh, some of the topics already surfaced and will resurface. And of course, three of our, uh, our, our present um, panelists were actively asking questions during the first part of the morning. So <laughs> there's already continuity there. And Michael, we are delighted to have you uh, as, as, uh, as a new face in the, in the crowd. Let me uh, take a couple of minutes to introduce our panelists and, and the topic broadly, and then we will proceed. So Kimball Chen is uh, chairman of the Global LPG Partnership. So LPG, for those of you who may not know, liquefied petroleum gas, both butane and propane. Uh, since his founding in 2012, he's an industry statesman in the LNG and LPG uh, sectors. He has more than 40 years of experience as a CEO, an investor, senior advisor to governments and international organizations. Uh, Kimball is also a member of the Harvard Radical Class of 73. <laughs> Jim Engel, also a member of the Harvard Radcliffe class of 73. He's Gurney Professor of English, Professor of Comparative Literature here at Harvard, now emeritus, or not? Uh, uh, wait three months. Three months. <laughs> <laughs> already, already happily uh, residing in Montana rather than Cambridge. Uh, but for those of us who think of Cambridge still as the center of the universe, this is deeply problematic. Uh, and, and, and that may come up for conversation. Um, Michael Hiscox, uh, Clarence Dillon, Professor of International Affairs in the Department of Government at Harvard, also founding director of the Sustainability, Transparency, and Accountability Research Lab, so conveniently referred to as the STAR it's Lab. It's just a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. A faculty member of the Behavioral Insights Group, and I think behavioral uh, is a component to what we're going to be talking about this afternoon, Import, as it was this morning, although we may not have used the term uh, there faculty associate of the uh, Institute for Quantitative Social Science, the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, and the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Aram Satter uh, leads and teaches in the Sustainable Water Management Program at Tufts, at the University's Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, and the Tufts Institute of the Environment. Aram has a doctorate in juridical sciences, so she is the lawyer in the panel this afternoon uh, from Harvard University. Uh, her current research focuses on the legal and institutional responses to climate change as it disrupts water availability. And I apologize, Aram, if that feels very, very narrowly focused, but you can, you can speak across the spectrum. So th th these are our panelists. And the topic, and, and I say this only as a, as a framing device, but if this morning we talked about specific cases working off of Nazmul's uh, Bangladesh example and specifically IDCOL, and if this morning we talked in particular about so population flows and individuals, and I think, uh, Diego, you, you helped us to understand that focus on individual human beings very nicely as we wound up the, the panel this morning. This afternoon, we're going to focus more broadly on institutions and systems, uh, which should not prevent the four of you from talking about people, uh, if you feel so. <laughs> uh, and, and, and let me start in part, uh, Michael, because uh, you have not yet had a voice in our conversations, and ask you about behavior and climate change and responses to climate change. Great. Uh, thanks, for, uh, everyone, for um, inviting me here to participate. This is, um, yeah, I, I think uh, when we talked, Lee, before the, the meeting, I, I thought about the research that I'm doing now. And um, I started years ago working on sustainability and um, what companies were doing in their global supply chains to address a range of sustainability issues from mostly human rights and labor standards in global supply chains. Uh, you know, in, at the time, uh, we were still thinking about the anti-sweatshop movement and how big retail 
and apparel companies were responding to uh, claims that they needed to do something to improve standards in their supply chain. I worked a lot with fair trade, again, mostly about human rights issues and living standards issues for farmers in developing countries and what companies here were doing to address the activists' uh, complaints about standards in their supply chains and the consumer demands to, uh, to know that their products were being made in ways that were not violating hum basic human rights. All of that work now has transitioned essentially to uh, decarbonization work. <laughs> so almost all those companies uh, and the new companies that I work with uh, focused on um, how they respond to demands by governments, uh, by uh, environmental groups, activist groups, and by the consumers and by the investors as well uh, to lead the way in terms of decarbonization, to offer some kinds of solutions to, um, to mitigate uh, and or to help people mitigate um, climate change and or adapt to the effects of climate change. Um, and so all of that uh, is essentially then pushing behavioral change. So if you think about what these companies are doing, um, some good examples, uh, we're, the, we're working with a range of banks, including the biggest bank in Australia, uh, to, uh, to offer their consumers discounted loans for rooftop solar systems on their homes for their homeowning customers and for uh, switching to EVs for customers who have um, uh, auto loans or are about to get auto loans. And so what, the, what the, the, uh, this requires is that to think about homeowners uh, and the decisions they make about energy use and the energy efficiency of their homes and to contemplate and then implement significant renovations to their homes, aided by the bank, to essentially shift their homes to lower emission homes, lower energy homes. Um, in Australia, so just thinking in that context for the moment as like the one of the major projects we're working on, um, the behavioral issue is that most people could probably, in Australia, homeowners can probably get to zero emissions, zero electricity bill um, with one set of renovations to their home. Home solar system, uh, heat pumps, uh, maybe some added insulation, and they turn their home into an energy uh, plant um, that makes money for them and doesn't cost anything. <laughs> That's probably about 80% of homes in Australia. Uh, it doesn't need new technology. It doesn't need new policy. It doesn't need new regulation. It's cash flow positive immediate, immediately for these homeowners at their current mortgage rate. Um, the problem is a behavioral change problem in that it's a really difficult thing to contemplate. It's from a cognitive point of view, it's a really big, complex decision about what kind of system for your home, all the other things that you can do, who are the service providers, how do you finance it, can you predict how it will pay off in terms of uh, reduced electricity costs. And so when we, when we do surveys and ask people about this behavioral change that they've contemplated but haven't taken yet, the overwhelming answer is, I know I should probably do it, but um, I just keep putting it off. And so that's a big part of our effort is to, just, is to just bundle or find some way to cut through that cognitive complexity for the regular homeowner to let them make this easy transition from a very energy um, inefficient home, which is for most Australians still the case, to one that's zero, zero emissions, zero electricity bill. So they're better off financially and, and you know, overall that would probably reduce Australia's aggregate emissions by about 9%, we think. But in this case, the activist stakeholder is the bank, the institution, not the consumer. Is that correct? So, there's, um, so the bank is responding. Um, so this bank that we're working with, uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, um, had, for, like most big banks in Australia, had a significant investment in fossil fuels. The activists and, um, that actually were quite, um, got a quite responsive um, board as well um, at the bank, uh, their main push was for the bank to um, divest from fossil fuels gradually, but also to help uh, with the energy transition in Australia more generally. Uh, they, they see, this bank sees about 40% of all transactions that are made in the Australian market every day, like in some way or other, they touch those transactions. Uh, so their ability to uh, affect the transition in terms of financing that would uh, facilitate these behavioral changes. Small business and big business, farmers as well as homeowners is tremendous. Um, so all they have to do is sort of think about what they can do and whether it's viable from a business point of view. 
the customers that seem to be demanding it and very, very happy about it. Um, you know, in part for environmental reasons, but in part because most of these decisions or behavioral changes are also improving their financial well-being. Um, the activist groups are very supportive and the government is very supportive. Uh, the current government is very supportive. The previous government was less supportive, <laughs> but the current government is very supportive. And so, um, in fact, I was at a meeting last week uh, with uh, the relevant department in the Australian government and their list of things that they wanted to happen in this space with, um, with EVs, with, uh, with solar, renewable energy generally, um, looked exactly like the list of things that this bank was working on. They were perfectly complementary. Thank you. Kimball, you have a different population, a different fuel okay. behavior, motivation, incentive. So uh, in order to, for you to understand the points I'm going to try to make, I have to tell you a little bit about what I do, why I do it, <clears throat> and general lessons I've learned, and then try to apply it to the subjects that we've discussed so far. So I'll try to do that very briefly. So what do I do? So I have a private sector set of activities and a public sector set of activities. In the private sector, I've spent the last 50 years in energy, uh, uh, particularly gas, uh, but I've done green energy development. I've uh, advised, got, uh, I've worked in public-private partnerships on energy projects. I've achieved major change in certain economies. I, I did the roadmap for the Chinese government to develop their LNG sector, for instance. So, so, so getting large projects done in complicated political and cultural environments. I've had experience doing that for self-interest, but they always had a public interest uh, angle because our, our family company's history was do good and do well. So we had a sort of a, an internal family culture of not just making money, but making money in a way that would also achieve public goals that were synergistic with whatever the host government or geography was. Um, <coughs> I've also done medical device development. I've, so I've had experience in a bunch of sectors, but principally energy. My public sector work is advising governments on energy security, the role of gas and other forms of energy in the economy, helping them develop the role of energy and energy mix in overall economic and social development. I've done this in the developed world and the developing world for countries ranging from Portugal or Romania or Argentina or Oman or or China, or Turkey, or Poland, Lithuania, to Sub-Saharan Africa and other places. Um, my particular public sector responsibility right now is to run a UN-mandated NGO focused on the um, assisting the developing world, or the Global South as the new term is, mm -hmm. on appropriate, the appropriate role of bottled gas, or LPG, in their energy mix, especially for reasons of energy transition, decarbonization from business as usual use of wood and charcoal, and for a multiplicity of other social and developmental goals which can only be achieved by clean cooking, which is the <coughs> subset of energy access that I am particularly asked by the UN to focus on. So that means things like health because you have cleaner air. Um, I don't know if all of you are aware that um, uh, air quality, uh, indoor air pollution, is responsible for 4 million deaths a year worldwide. It's, one, it's the biggest uh, non-contagious disease killer in the world, it's, and it kills more people every year than malaria, TB, and HIV put together, but, does, but doesn't get any solution funding. Um, and the uh, World Health Organization, on several panels I sit, uh, is very concerned about this. And the International Energy Agency has now made this the year of clean cooking. So LPG is the most evidence-based transition solution which can be implemented and financed and is possible, but it faces uh, the question of, of, of uh, existence and thriving in an ideological world where evidence-based analysis and solutions don't always win the day. And I can tell you more about that in, 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 in later in this discussion. So I do public sector work which involves creation of public-private partnerships to achieve a societal goal which tries to accomplish a bunch of related <clears throat> goals. It's not only clean cooking, and therefore less indoor air pollution, therefore better health, but it also, uh, a large percentage of the deforestation in Sub-Saharan Africa comes from fuel gathering. 
So switching to bottled gas, every country in Africa wants bottled gas. The developed world financial institutions won't support it because of the ideological bias against supporting uh, incremental fossil fuel um, spreading. So that's a, a disconnect between a goal which societies want, including all countries, and the means by which a goal is achieved. So there's a dissonance there. So that's what I do. Um, and why do I do it? I told you there's a family tradition. So I'm under internal uh, ethical pressure to do, to do stuff a certain way. The general questions I want to put on the table for this panel to hopefully consider in, in, their, in my colleagues' points is the, is the following. I, I don't believe in unconstrained profit maximization. I think this is very bad for the overall development of society and humanity. And in fact, that's why the debate about whether companies should take a position on decarbonization is, is, is so important. The role of public-private partnerships, it's a great concept to have the public and private supporting each other, but you need to have the rules of the game established so that the two of them can thrive together. This means creation of an enabling environment of policy and, uh, other pro and regulation which will last long enough for the goals to be achieved. A third thing is you have to understand what actually makes private sector organizations make decisions and allocate capital. That is not focused on enough. Um, then you have questions about, is green the goal or is greener the goal? Are we in a transition or are we trying to look for an absolute immediate achievement of a goal? Green immediately is impossible and it's not financeable. Greener is a question of degree and how, and then there are issues of equity and justice depending on global north or global south. Um, big thing, ba it's bad to invest in unproven solutions at scale prematurely. This is one of the issues about going electrical, which everybody uh, will understand. The, every government, every prime minister and minister of energy in Africa doesn't want to invest prematurely in stuff, have to buy it from the global north and become an economic dependent on the global north and not develop their own human capacity. So you've got issues of justice and about uh, when is the right thing to do. Negative consequences of deglobalization. Deglobalization means that self-interest and not the collective interest across borders, of, in other words, multilateral cooperation, uh, are, is going to become more important. So self-interest of nations is a, is a really terrible thing that we have to contend with on an increasing matter. Okay, and I don't believe in a lot of the blah, blah, blah places <laughs> like COP and Davos and so forth, and I can tell you more about that later. Sorry, it took too long. <laughs> Thank you, Kimball. You threatened a rant. I don't think this was a rant, but th th there's passion there. <laughs> That's a very good thing. Well, Aram, I see you have the latest New York Times in front of you. Is this a prop that with a specific I purpose? I like show and tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sally was kind enough to give me her paper. This is yesterday's front page of the New York Times. And the headline says, the East Coast is sinking. If you open it to page 12, it's a double page layout. And what it shows you is where along the entire eastern seaboard of the United States, there is land subsidence, which is a function of both sea level rise as well as groundwater extraction. So I think and obsess about water. These are linked and it is absolutely linked to climate change. So I would actually really urge, I mean, if you really want like a horror story, Go ahead and actually read this because this is happening. And it goes to something that Michael said, which is if you somehow show people, they change their behavior. I'm a skeptic of this because there is plenty of evidence. People have run um, um, studies showing in Florida, for instance, where people have showed uh, property owners maps of like, this is your house and this will change your insurance rates. You are subject to flooding and they just get blown off. They're not believed and, you know, it's not like grasped and internalized. So I'm, that's sort of where I am and that's my broad framing. I don't think so. Also because before I ever went to law school, I actually worked in public health and in something very specific called behavior change uh, <coughs> communication. So I really have an understanding of this from like the actual individual level to communities. How do they behave and how do we get policy? Just a few other things, and I just want to acknowledge where we are, and um, in terms of just, again, putting this out there so that, you know, just you have some of my data points with you. 
Uh, so originally I happen to be from Pakistan. We've talked a lot about Bangladesh this year, but I want to put a few things on the table. There were massive floods in Pakistan in 2022. About an area the size of England was underwater. That's massive, right, in terms of land mass. The estimated damage was about $30 billion, that that's what it would take to recover. Okay. At the moment, as we speak, there is some place called Gavadar, which is a major now wanting to be a port city. It's a big part of like the Belt and Road Initiative. Talk about geopolitics. Uh, that is under flooding. There's been 30 hours of nonstop rain and people's lives are completely destroyed. They are fishermen, so their boats have been wrecked and this has livelihood impacts. There's no understanding of how they will recover and how they will cope. As we sit here in Texas, the largest wildfire in the state's history, as well as Oklahoma, 1.2 million acres is burning. There is talk about air quality and impacts on life expectancy and health. It's not just indoor air quality is bad. Um, we have estimates that all of the gains from air quality improvements will be lost and squandered because we will have uh, the wildfires, say, as burned last year in Canada, for instance, right? So all of us are the poorer. It's not just, it's not from stores where we're burning wood. It, this is a much bigger global problem. So I just wanted to put the scale of that challenge and to put the UN climate change, uh, because I know the afternoon session is also talking about the potential for climate finance and how we may access funds for a transition. I'm a deep skeptic about how far we are from what we will need. Just in Pakistan's case alone, it is estimated that we will need about $350 billion just for Pakistan, which is granted the fifth largest country in the world by population size. Uh, but, you know, one country, about approximately 250 million people, that $340 billion will be needed by 2030, which is around the corner. It's really, really soon. Um, and to date, over the last 30 years, under the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, and there are three facilities under that starting in the 90s, the country has only been able to access $1 billion worth of funds. So the scale between what may be needed for a transition and what is on the table right now and in play is, is, is incredible to my, to, my, to my sort of understanding. And lastly, uh, at the moment, the U.S. is the largest uh, 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 sort of natural gas and oil exporter in the world at the moment. So I know we like to sort of like say bad things about like, you know, the Republicans are bad and do this. But under Biden, who, you know, he should actually be running around taking credit. The oil and gas industry is raking over profits left, right and center. There's a huge political angle to this also. But this is news from just the end of last month. There's something called Climate Action 100 Plus which was trying to get a lot of uh, investment managers to, res to sort of like uh, invest for environmental and social governance goals, ESG goals. And this is, um, I think it's fascinating. So Representative uh, Jim Jordan, who perhaps a lot of you may be familiar with, um, <clears throat> I want to read you what he tweeted on X. Um, Essentially, a bunch of uh, investment managers said that they were no longer going to be a part of Climate Action 100 plus because Republican majority states, this was a question about Vermont and Florida, have threatened them with lawsuits that this is public money and you cannot invest in this way. So this is a massive issue. And he, Jim Jordan, has launched an investigation against Climate Action 100 Plus, who was trying to do ESG, uh, saying that they are actually colluding. So now there's antitrust uh, actions that are coming for companies colluding. I, I know you said like I'm the lawyer on the table, so I'm this. You know, this is so it's it's the concept of lawfare, right? You can use perhaps the law for good, but you can you know, work on this also and do this. Okay, so this is what he tweets. Jim Jordan, I apologize for like actually telling you what his tweet is, but this is what it is, okay? 
big wins for freedom and the American economy. And we hope more financial institutions follow suit in abandoning collusive ESG actions. So now, if you are a big money manager and you want to manage funds in a certain way, you will have a lot of perhaps, you know, at a minimum committee hearings coming at you. It's not hopeful. So I apologize for just sort of um, being uh, not very, you know, pleasant about this, but that's how I see what's happening. This is tokenism on our part. We knew we needed a skeptic somewhere in the mix. <laughs> you, needed the, you needed the South Asian woman, exactly, to, you know, tell you, like, no. Thank you, Aaron. Jim. And I, th I, I neglected to uh, say in my introduction of you, aside from your uh, being a classmate, that you are part of the Salata Institute at Harvard and have been for some time, I think, since its establishment. That's right. <clears throat> thank you very much, Lee. And I want to thank Lee, too, uh, for being the Iron Man of the day. <laughs> uh, every panel, every Q&A. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the reception, Lee. <laughs> Be there. Yeah. As someone who has trained and spent his life in the humanities, I think one of the issues that we need to take into account in what we have been discussing is what I might style a moral imagination. Uh, we have heard the word moral once or twice today and the word ethics once or twice. And of course, it's related to social justice and equity. It's related to growing inequalities. Uh, and that imagination has to take into account many different things. So I want to mention a, a couple of them now. First of all, of course, climate science. I teach a course with Jim Anderson on climate science. Jim was going to try to come here today just to chat at lunch but he had a grant proposal due today for his climate observatory, a series of solar-powered stratospheric aircraft that will give much finer grain detail on climate measurements than satellites possibly can. But here is, I think, what Jim Anderson would say about climate science were he here. I will try to put this briefly. Things are, um, as the old baseball phrase went, they're getting late early. We now have some uh, good evidence that whatever we call climate disruption is accelerating. It is not linear. It is logarithmic. There are tipping points we cannot identify and we are not even sure whether we have passed some or not. <clears throat> whether it's sea level rise, or whether it's global mean surface sea temperature, or Antarctic ice, or Greenland ice cap melt, or West Antarctic ice sheet movement, every single one of the data points on all of those have moved in ways recently that scientists characterize with words such as worrisome, inexplicable, scary, and a word that scientists rarely use but have used recently, alarming. The recent science of the last six months to 18 months is yet another wake-up call. Jim Anderson would also say, don't use the term global warming. Yes, we have blown past 1.5 degrees centigrade, probably past two, and maybe even are approaching three are on our current trajectory. And at three, most commentators a generation ago said the results would be catastrophic but that's what we are now beginning to approach. Jim Anderson would say that what we are facing is the destruction of Earth's climate systems, and the one he is particularly concerned about is the cryosphere. That is to say all of the ice structures in the world. 
the Arctic ice, the Antarctic ice, mountain glaciers, and the Greenland ice cap. You can say that it is heat that is destroying these, and that, in a sense, is right, and you can say they're melting, but in terms of physics, they are disintegrating, and they will not be able to be reformed unless we do one thing, which most people find simply now a theory, but we will need to do it. We will need to do solar geoengineering. There is really no doubt about that if you understand the physics of the situation. If we don't do that, the cryosphere will disappear. It is a matter of understanding entropy and the laws of physics, which are fairly simple. That's where we're headed with our current science. This is generally known by a number of scientists, but it is not yet in the public realm. I won't go into solar geoengineering in detail. It's been done on a local scale in eastern Australia to help save the barrier reef. There are global scales of it which are different, which have not even yet been experimentally tested. Can we take out enough carbon dioxide from the atmosphere quickly enough to stop this? Well, that's an open question, but that will need to be done too cut emissions drastically, which we aren't doing, take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which we are doing at a tiny scale currently, and perform solar geoengineering. That's really where the current science points to. And it points to it more and more urgently all the time. Well, maybe I will provide a bit of a rant. <laughs> so let me say a word about <clears throat> uh, economic study. If you have an opportunity to look at a recent article by Stieglitz, Stern, and Taylor, Joseph Stieglitz, Nicholas Stern, and Charlotte Taylor, they take to task the way the economics profession has treated climate. Um, the work of Nordhaus is important. He won a Nobel Prize. Stieglitz Stern and others, myself included, though I'm no economist, believe his discount rates are all wrong, that his estimate of damages are far too low, and that the idea of discounting human life is unethical. This goes back to issues of intergenerational justice. You start discounting human life in your economic calculations, and you're in for a different kind of world, maybe, than the one we've been living in. So, Kimball made a marvelous point. Unconstrained profit maximization is not what we really should be after. It's not that we want to do away with profit. That's not the point at all. There has to be profit. But unconstrained profit maximization is an enemy. So between public, private, institutions, policy, and regulation, we have to move the needle enough so that the current great flywheel of society is somehow redirected, that its inertia, which is enormous, is somehow changed. I go back to the point about imagination. To envision a world 20, 30, 40 years from now is extremely hard. We all know, for example, that population predictions have so often been inaccurate predictions of all other kinds are often wrong. But I would suggest that a moral imagination, which takes into account the science, the economics, the inequalities of the world, the different impacts that climate will have on the poor and on the rich, suggest a radical rethinking of some policies in a manner that we have not yet achieved. That we are beginning to see it a little in the economics profession. We have seen it in the science. And we are perhaps also beginning to see it in the private sector. To coordinate these is an enormous challenge. But it is one that um, I would go back to points made this morning by Diego and others. It's a, it's a challenge of social capital and human capital as much as it is anything else. 
Um, is there hope? Yes, I think there's hope. Um, but there's hope only if action is initiated, and we haven't yet got to the point where that action is catching up to the negative externalities of our previous action. Thank you, Jim. Let me take a piece of what you said toward the end and, and ask the four of you, so coming back to you as well, Jim, but yeah, you, you talk about coordinating across these different fields of endeavor. Do we see people who are actually doing that? I mean, is this uh, people, individuals, but also organizations, whether it's private sector, public sector, people who, ha who are engaged in the, the kind of coordination that you're asking us to do in the name of what? moral imagination, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Well, just very quickly, Climate 100 Plus was trying to do that, and then, <laughs> then they got <laughs> slapped. Um, but yes, I think there are, and there are individuals who are certainly trying to do it. Uh, and there are companies that are trying to do it. There are. It, it's, well, I'll name Kimball's company, for one. I mean, and, and there are others. I mean, there are some energy companies in the world that are investing more and more of their capital expenditures into things that aren't exploration and extraction. Um, not the big ones and not the state-owned ones yet, but sooner or later I think people will realize that if they don't start doing that, they are on the ship with everyone else. Mm -hmm. And um, that takes a moral imagination because it means getting out of your own self-interest. Yeah, I think um, I totally agree. Um, just thinking about um, you know what was what Aram said about behavioral change. So Australia is a good case study of what happened after the bushfires. Um, you know what three four years ago. Um, you know we were monitoring. I was there at the time. We were monitoring public opinion and um, climate change uh, or environment in general was um, was rated I think seventh in polls on the most important issue for Australians. You know, it was jobs, economy, it was healthcare, it was a few other things. Uh, within the space of two months, it went to the most important issue for all Australians by a clear margin and stayed that way for a long time. It's, uh, it's second, I think, at the moment. Um, you know, at the time, we had a conservative government, including that had a whole bunch of climate change deniers. Um, uh, you know, we have now subsequently had a complete change of government that was based upon people saying that that government wasn't doing enough to address climate change quickly enough. Um, and, you know, the, the new government has changed completely and there's a whole bunch of, you know, it's in a tough position because it is facing those trade-offs between, you know, the price of energy and how that affects uh, those in the in, in lower income levels and managing that um, as well as addressing climate change. But it is now doing something very quickly. And all the late leading companies in Australia, they're, being, they're going to be at this event that I'm going to in two weeks, uh, all the CEOs of Australia's largest corporations, uh, to talk about uh, the transition in Australia, how long it will take, how to speed it up, what companies can do in concert with government. Um, I've worked on behavioral change. I started the Australian, Australian government's behavioral um, economics team in 2015 and worked on a whole bunch of projects where we had tremendous success in large scale behavioral change. I, I think it's hard, but it's not impossible, especially when you have this kind of facilitating environment with a lot of moral um, uh, you know, engagement around a purpose that's shared by, um, by voters as, you know, um, when they're thinking about what their government is doing, and those same individuals when they're thinking about what companies are doing, those companies that they're buying products from, um, flying with, banking with. Um, and so I think, um, you know, watch this space but i think but i think you know dramatic change is possible it it requires and it's not to say that behavioral change alone you know the power of consumers shopping more smartly will do it right it's just that we should that should happen and be accelerated at the same time and those same people vote for governments that can create structural change uh, with new regulation so the two go hand in hand it's not um it's not one or the other and i think we're seeing it go hand in hand pretty effectively in Australia at the moment. So we did this talk this morning about a unifying narrative. It sounds like you have engineered such a narrative. <laughs> I think, I, well, it frustrates me. Um, you know, I've never said behavioral change, individuals taking action is the solution to all our problems. But um, 
individuals want to be part of the solution. Like they're, like they're desperate, you know, uh, when you talk to homeowners or parents, they're desperate to figure out how they can make the world better. And, and, um, and so, you know, I, and that is, that is, you know, we can't sort of say, well, but that's only going to be limited and people are going to be, you know, it's going to be hard. But so we want some top-down solution that we, as, as smart people, say this is what the government should do, carbon tax, whatever it is. Um, you know, that you don't get that change without individuals voting for governments who do that thing, right? Those are the same individuals who are motivated, who are trying to do things as consumers, who we need to have behavioral change in the form of supporting governments and policies that will solve the problem with bigger uh, regulatory solutions at the same time. So it does go hand in hand. It is part of the same um, movement, if you like. <laughs> Kimball, Jim uh, cited your companies as an example of a private sector endeavor that embraces moral imagination. You want to talk about that? You know, that's just a family thing. So uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there are other families who have the same kinds of things. But uh, I, I want to talk about systemic things, not the particular you know, approach of a, a particular family, my family, <laughs> any other family, because I want to come back to what Mike was saying also, and also what, what Jim was talking about. <clears throat> so. It, Around the world, and I've dealt with so many governments and international institutions, everyone now, and they should have focused on this generations ago, but it's focused on balkanization. So you've got this ministry and this ministry, and they don't connect their interests and, their, and how to align themselves. I'll give you a simple example. So in, in, um, in Africa, the, uh, the calculation by the World Bank of lost GDP because of the consequences of uh, indoor air pollution which is, comes from cooking with traditional fuels, wood and charcoal, and sometimes dung, um, is 6.5% annually. So how, do they how does the World Bank calculate that? They look at the, the implied or actual cost of morbidity, of sickness and death. They look at you know, lost productivity. They, lo they look at the amount of time that uh, you know, women lose taking care of the house or children. 6.5% is a huge amount of money. But the benefit of eliminating indoor air pollution doesn't accrue to anybody who has agency to, to pay for the solution. So for instance, in the, developed, in the global south, you don't have developed pension systems or insurance life insurance. Life insurance companies and pension funds benefit when people live longer. So they have a definite motivation to contribute to better health outcomes because it, it helps their economics. But the health ministries in these poor countries don't have any access to any benefits that's created by better health. The Ministry of Finance is more focused on things like keeping the basic engine of the economy running. They're not worried about something which is a long-term problem with long-term evidence of a problem. So you have a disconnect between the objectives and the motivations and the incentives for government to work together. Now, let's look at how government interacts with society. Uh, people worry about their immediate needs first. So in the global south, you worry about, do I have enough food? Do I have enough water? Uh, do I, can my children maybe get an education? You're not focused on things like, um, how do I change my political system to achieve long-term policy stability, to integrate a bunch of ministries who don't work together and are run by different parties in, coalition, in a coalition government system. So <laughs> getting people to focus on their individual welfare in near term and how it connects with the longer term group welfare and a national system which can be stable. This is a very complicated ecosystem of motivation, incentive, and, and punishments or not, and who, who shares benefits and costs. Um, so when I, when I think about, yes, there are individual data points of good companies. You have individual data points of a country which manages to get a consensus bipartisan, probably, mm -hmm. in Australia, in a massive major change. Mm -hmm. The question is whether the Australian case study has elements which other countries or enlightened people in other countries would try on a bipartisan basis in their country to try to emulate and, 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 and create a benefit. I mean, Australia, what, what Michael described in Australia is inspiring, but the question is whether that unique confluence of circumstances and factors could happen elsewhere. I, I would like to think it would, but I, I think it's a complicated thing. So this, to summarize, alignment of people in the critical mass of alignment necessary to achieve long-term and permanent change 
is very, very difficult. So you have to define mm -hmm. the, the problems and have a consensus about the problem definition and have a consensus about the way in which you analyze the problem to decide as a society the solution. If you, if you don't trust science, i.e. the United States, <laughs> if, you don't, uh, if you don't trust uh, majority decisions, whatever that means, if you don't trust government, these are all major deficits in your forthcoming ability to solve problems. On the hopeful side, Kimball, I, I don't think I'm wrong to point out that this morning you identified Bangladesh as an exception as well. Uh, so we've got Australia and Bangladesh <laughs> now as examples of successful nation state endeavors. Yeah, yeah. Right? Cricket playing nations yeah, wait, wait, as well. Wait, wait, so that's if I may point. differ in Nazbol, mm -hmm. you could jump on me at, at any moment if I say something that you disagree with. Bangladesh, uh, you had technocrats looking at human needs defining a way forward with the whole government behind it, all the ministries, and you were able to affect a solution, even though the general population wasn't uh, knowledgeable about the larger issues and consequences. They were looking at their immediate need, which you satisfied. In Australia, the voters understood the large issues, and were, uh, so it's a, it's a difference. Is that difference fair to, to, to state? Yes and no. So, <laughs> all right. So, so the way I see it in Australia, uh, it's yeah very similar program like what we did, but probably on a much bigger scale uh, with the population who are like more aware of the technology and the financial systems in place. Uh, in, in Bangladesh, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say that the entire government was behind it. Actually, there were a lot of protests from the utilities who wanted to like do grid integration rather than like going for off-grid solution. They kind of felt like that's kind of killing their market. So, but there was a strong leadership, of course, which, which supported uh, despite some protest from other, other, other ministries and parties. But in general, yes, I, I, I support in that part that some part of the technocracy definitely supported that uh, and, and found it a good solution and they found that rather than waiting for 30 years for the grid to come, it's, there are benefits to provide electricity to people ahead of time uh, without much waiting, yeah. Thank you, Nesbon. Aram, I'm gonna stress test your skepticism here. Can you uh, try uh, applying Jim's moral imagination to water, which is your specialty? Is there room for such as the east coast of the United States sinks slowly into the sea? I would absolutely love for there to be. I think about this very hard and very closely. But again, I don't see it, neither in, on the east coast nor on the west. Part of the east coast problem is that this is about uh, groundwater getting sucked up. And that's a lot of smaller wells, city wells. So there's a lot of collective action problem, right? How do you get everybody to be going in the same direction? Um, and when you get to transboundary, it actually becomes even harder. If you stand at, say, the Colorado um, and look at the last several, in fact, 100 miles of the delta that goes down into Mexico, it's dry. There's nothing going down. Um, so how do you, if you can't do it within a country, within geopolitical boundaries, how do you do it across? The Indus is what I know most closely. There, the prospects of cooperation between, say, the two biggest protagonists, right, India and Pakistan, is, is, is very broken at the moment. Now, maybe everyone will become very, um, um, you know, self-enlightened and think we should think morally and that we have to think for generations out. At the moment, the institutional, because that's part of what you're trying to get us to focus on, those institutional mechanisms for that kind of cooperation do not exist. It's in no one's interest to sit and talk to somebody else and try and figure out a better way. And there's no institutional collaboration that will make that possible. So specifically with water, and the reason water is important you're absolutely right, is because it is massively affected by climate. The more the planet warms, the more drying we're going to see. And a flood is very visible, right? And you can see rain, but a drought is harder to grasp. Um, at the moment in this country, we are sitting um, US snowpack 
coverage is at 13 percent of national average. 13 percent at this point in time, and today is the 1st of March. So this is a huge problem. What will happen in spring? What will happen in summer? Will we have to go more to groundwater to live, which is exactly what will happen, right? I can completely envisage the city of Cambridge sending me a postcard saying, we're in a drought in summer. It's going to come because we have no snowpack, right? So where are they going to go? Um, so I, again, um, you know, I know you want to stress test my skepticism, but I think it'll hold up. <laughs> I, I'm going to bet on that for, you know. And, and yet here you are on a panel on responses to climate change. To, to maybe raise, raise, like give us the night, the heebie-jeebies, right? <laughs> like we need to sort of wake up and think, oh my God, are we grasping the chemistry and the physics of what is happening? I, May I inject, a, can I add to her skepticism, but then give please. a ray of hope? <laughs> so please. Satisfy the, Thank you, Kimball. The masses here. Here, um, here. <laughs> I think climate mitigation is a lost cause until we reach a step change in the actual physical uh, makeup of the world, so maybe 100 years from now. So I think we talk climate mitigation, but uh, change mitigation, but actually what smart people and smart government should be doing is, is focusing money and long-term investment and policy on adaptation. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. climate change mitigation is a, is a lost cause in terms of mm -hmm. uh, two degrees or th three degrees. Um, one of our classmates, you, you know uh, Jesse Ozabel? Yes. OK, so Jesse Ozabel is the is the, as a leader in de decarbonization thinking. He's organized the first COP for the UN. He started writing papers about this back in the 1970s, one of our classmates. I had lunch with him in New York, and, uh, and he said, you know, um, we, we, in a deglobalizing world with the geopolitical problems we have right now, there's going to be no cross-border cooperation. So we have to just live our ge next generation has to live with the consequences. Mm -hmm. So let's prepare for the consequences. Mm -hmm. Sobering from a guy who has a long perspective mm -hmm. on this. So I, Jim, and then I want to come back to you, Kimball, because I think the, the, the distinction between mitigation and adaptation, mm -hmm. which surfaced in this morning's discussion, needs further expansion. Can I ask, there's no ray of light. Involved. I know, remember that, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the ray of light is a fault. Thank you. Well, probably, Probably be, there is a, a, some distance between uninhabitable Earth and an Earth in which a certain amount of humans can live in geographies as maybe habitable at the, that time. Okay, so, be, so there's some hope for some portion of humanity for several hundred years. Okay, how's that? <laughs> Very thin. That's the best he's got. <laughs> can, can you save us, Jim? <laughs> Well, we need to save ourselves, yes. Uh, insofar as the question of mitigation and adaptation has come up, because it's an important one, there was a period of time, now clearly past, in which some people said, we need to focus completely on mitigation and put all our energies there and think later about adaptation. That was misguided because they didn't have the imagination to project what was happening and therefore what would eventually be the case. On the other hand, if one defines, as it generally is defined, mitigation to be the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, that's the scientific definition of mitigation, we will have to do that. We have to continue to do that because otherwise we are assigning a death warrant, not just for ourselves, but for many species. So I don't think it's so much either or as it is both, that we need to reduce emissions considerably. Uh, we need to do that, as the Overshoot Commission said, as quickly as possible, whatever that means, but we do need to do it. And then we need to do a great deal about adaptation simply in order to make a uh, certain parts of the world more livable. We just have to. Uh, people are going to have to move. There's going to have to be managed retreat. I'd also make a quick point about you know, what, what activates us to do this. 
It's interesting that in Australia, it was the fires, the terrible fires. And there is a, a notion which I once was more skeptical about than I am now, is that a, a population needs to experience a shock, a visible shock to itself in order to mobilize this coordination effort. Alas, that may be true. Um, finally, I would say that, interestingly enough, although I'm not advocating it as a political model, the government of China will probably meet its emission standards two to three years earlier than it said it was going to meet them. And it has recently spent far more money on the energy transition to renewables than any other country by far, and more than several other countries combined. That is because I think the Chinese engineers understand what the future will be if they don't do that. So they have increased their solar capacity enormously. They are now talking about having the largest offshore wind power in the world. And they have another resource that this country also has, but the Chinese are beginning to develop, which is geothermal. So, you know, can it be done? In fact, despite the fact that we all hear American politicians say, well, the Chinese are emitting more than the US, the Chinese curve of emissions looks a lot better now than it did a few years ago. And their actual investment in renewables is remarkable. And, you know, you'll soon be seeing Chinese EVs in your American showroom unless people want to keep them out. We need to talk about the political framework within which that is happening. <laughs> well, I said I'm not holding that up as a political model. Uh, that's a difficulty. Lee. Uh, it is. That is, I mean, to a large extent, a centrally controlled economy, increasingly so uh, recently. And it's an authoritarian state in many respects. Um, I guess my only point is that one can, under certain conditions, mobilize such resources. That is to say, the resources are there. So it's a question then of mobilizing them, and maybe it takes brush fires, or maybe, it ta maybe it'll take uh, three Category 5 hurricanes in Florida. I don't know, uh, one after another. But that, that actually is another question. So the, the, the fires in, in Australia were significant. Uh, we, we talked about Vermont earlier, uh, and Vermont is the least likely to, um, uh, among the, what is it, uh, 50 U.S. states, uh, Peter, to be... Higher United States. Uh, th this is approximately right, but th there's a list of counties according to climate risk, or, and you know, or actually various disasters: heat, uh, uh, hurricanes, floods, fires. Vermont of the of the ten least risky counties, something like six of them are in Vermont. Vermont only has 14 counties, and of the 25 least risky, I think all of them are in Vermont. Right. Um, and yet. Yeah, and yet in Lamoille County, which is the least risky county in the entire United States, there was serious flooding this last summer. Right, so what is the mm. magnitude of the shock we will need, Jim, in order to... <laughs> mm. Well, unfortunately, we won't know until it occurs. You know, shocks can have a deleterious effect on policy decisions by, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in a very weird way. For instance, the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan chilled nuclear power development globally. And yet, a lot of climate advocates and, and, and policymakers mm -hmm. understand that nuclear power is the best way to decarbonize, and you have a, 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 a very concentrated risk of nuclear uh, dis, um, disposal, but it's different from everybody dying from climate increase, uh, you know, mm -hmm. temperature increase. So, mm -hmm. so Nuclear power, what is France, 70% nuclear power? Okay. Well, they're in a pretty good position. Look at Germany uh, trying to go green, and they have a huge economic and political crisis. So, you know, it's, it's uh, disasters don't always have a good effect. They can have a chilling effect on the long-term decisions made by other people. Well, I was talking about climate disasters. Uh, Fukushima was a man-made disaster in large part because they didn't build a seawall at the recommended height. Mm to protect the 
insanely positioned emergency water pumps, which were not up high, but down low. Anyway, that's, that's another story. <laughs> Aram, it looked like you wanted to get in. I just wanted to put the conversation of, uh, which as we know, 2024 is the year of elections, and a huge sort of chunk of the world's population is going to the polls. Um, I think that uh, uh, national conservatism seems to be on the rise. The Economist had a long piece on this. Farmers are on the march in many European countries, and there is great pushback against the EU's green recommendations. Um, and they're saying the tax is going to fall on farmers. And farmers are, in India, they were up in arms starting last year. But now, across Europe, we are seeing farmers are on the march. So to say that the politics cannot be delinked, and absolutely politicians and those in power have to respond to you know, what their populations are upset about. And um, you know, if you threaten that we are going to shut down Paris, Macron has to respond. Someone has to figure out that we cannot shut down Paris. So it's not easy uh, to, to sort of stand for doing something that may be in the longer term interests of humanity, but here you are and you have an election in six months and uh, you know, that'll be that. Um, we see this across the UK. We see everybody um, sort of walking back promises that they have made that they will, you know, do uh, because they're facing significant mm -hmm. pushback. Right. And so the <clears throat> the idea, and I, and and it makes perfect sense that we can't delink politics from the 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 responses broadly to climate change, still stands next to Jim's assertion, maybe invitation to recognize that someone's got to be coordinating across sectors and across industries, across interest groups, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when I ask, so who are we talking about? I think we got a couple of examples. I, I, I don't want to let that question die because in, in the face of our radical panel skepticism, I think we still need to hear at the end of this, which will happen in about 25 minutes, that there's some hope somewhere in here for all of us collectively. But the audience has questions for you, lady and gentlemen. So the floor is open. Questions? Peter. <clears throat> one of the questions, uh, one of the, um, again, to come back to Vermont for a second, there was always a bit of a planet Vermont mentality to climate issues. We'll fix it in Vermont. But of course, that doesn't do anything. It's a small place. And so the, the question I have is, what, if you think of the places that have the great, uh, and again, I'm sorry, this is just on the mitigation side, Jim, but to uh, have the greatest um, uh, uh, emissions, would it make sense to be investing for example, on, in solar in India, which is a sunny place, offsetting coal and uh, you know uh, uh, sort of you know, inefficient uh, oil facilities, as opposed to a, a mentality in which each country is trying to fix its own, or even in the U.S., each state. Thank you. I think that's possible. Uh, I mean. A lot of this has to do with a willingness to look beyond one's own self-interest and to look to a, a greater common good and to understand that what is being paid is not just an expense, it is an investment. But of course, that's very hard for private companies to make. Now, there are a lot of public utilities in the United States, and there are also a lot of privately run utilities in the United States. And I happen to live in a state now in Montana which did away with its public run utilities and now has private utilities that are supposedly under the aegis of a public service commission, which seems to have forgotten the word public. I'm not kidding. So I, I think, Peter, that a lot of this has to do with governance. And to go back to Lee's question, I want to suggest 
a bit of hope by looking historically at this crisis in the light of other crises. Almost all other crises which are, to my mind, somewhat analogous to the human suffering that is being inflicted now were addressed by a mass movement, very often of poorer or dispossessed people. The abolition movement, which was of course led also in part by well-to-do people, but the labor movement, the women's movement, Gandhi's movement, uh, that is what I think we will ultimately see. I would not be surprised if at a certain point in the future, in various countries or across borders, you saw very large numbers of individuals who traditionally did not have a powerful voice actually come together under a leader whom you may not like for the modes being used, who is going to insist that change comes because there has just been too much suffering. We haven't used the word suffering much, but in the end, that's what we're talking about here. And I think that that may actually bring change. It has seemed to be required in every other similar situation historically, uh, because the individuals who are in power very often don't seem to be able to coordinate until they're forced to. And you don't have to have a democracy for that to happen. Part of the reason China changed some of its environmental policies was because there were riots in the northern cities over air pollution, and they just couldn't stand that kind of public pressure, although they didn't publicize it. Hera, Kimball, Michael? Could I just take a slightly different uh, sort of take on this? So I actually think that we are, there are very good uh, sort of models that say by the end of the century, what's the likelihood of what degree of warming? And one of the highest thinks that we'll get to four degrees Celsius increase. And so you're right, how much will a small place, Vermont, Massachusetts, in that global context be able to save itself or delink itself? We saw Dustin put at the beginning, right, where he said like, where are, um, these projects cited, right? So we could see where they're sort of geographically located. So how much of our food and how much of um, everything that may be consumed in Vermont is coming from where, right? And how much can we de-link from what's happening uh, in broader places is I think something we have to think about very, very hard. And I don't think that smaller places will be um, either be able to be as affluent, or once you really look at what percentage of Vermont's food that Vermont consumes is grown within Vermont, I would suggest that it would probably be a tiny, tiny amount. So where are the calories coming from? My, my point's a little different, which is if you're in Vermont, or you would do, do much better not, you, sorry, if you're in Vermont, you would do much better not to be looking at Vermont solutions than to take the same amount of money and invest it in India where you're going to offset more carbon. And therefore, it really isn't a, a question, Jim, of, of, of you know, being generous. It is in your own self-interest to, to do that. Yeah, I would agree completely. So, it is self-interest rightly understood. Yeah, in I mean, in some sense, the slogan, um, think globally, act locally, might be turned around. Uh, think locally uh, by think locally by acting globally. I, I think that's a lot of what the investment sort of trajectory change movement was about. That look, it is in your own self interest to invest like this because you may actually get better returns and get all of these other benefits, and you know it's better for the longer term. But it is. It's a challenge, not that it's not a good idea to sort of try, because we wanted to think that you could do in investments, you could do well by doing good. And that now is facing significant pushback, that no, you can't actually do as good. I used to co-teach a class with an economist, and one of the things apparently economists talk about is revealed preference. 
And so, you know, when you go, an economist does a survey, would you pay more for better tuna, right? Safer tuna. And a lot of people will say yes, but when they actually go to the grocery store, much fewer will actually buy the more expensive tuna. So economists like to apparently look at revealed preference, uh, which tells you how they're actually behaving versus what they're saying that they will do. So, so you're, you're getting a, a, a victory sign here from Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Al, Al knows like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. immediate like, responses. He's uh, like, that's my language. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but uh, I mean, so that, I mean, that's why we have behavioral economics is because we don't trust revealed preference because there's a whole reason, exactly. a bunch of reasons why people can't turn good intentions into actions, right? Mm -hmm. And it may be because the messaging is confusing or because, you know, they have a habit or because they have problems of self-control. And, like, it, it's not that they right. their stated preferences are untrue. Mm -hmm. It's that acting on those preferences is, is difficult for lots of reasons that are beyond the control of the individual. Now, it is true that there's social desirability bias and people know that the right thing is often yeah. this. And so, <laughs> yeah, I love my mother. You know, I'll buy the, I'll buy the low carbon thing. Right. Uh, it, you know, but it's also true there's a lot of people who want to buy the low carbon thing and they can't identify it mm -hmm. because it's very difficult to do, right? Or, or they don't have the resources to do it because mm -hmm. it's priced too high. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we just... Yeah, I think we have to take that with a grain of, grain of salt. But I wanted to, I'm going to jump the queue and respond to Peter's point. Like, um, so a bunch of the companies that I work with, and I think it is in response to you, Zuela Roma, is that, that um, uh, you know, so a lot of the work we do is still in the, comp the supply chain area with big companies in food and fiber. So Haynes is one, uh, Woolworths is a big grocery chain in Australia. And uh, so they're under a lot of pressure from both investors and their consumers. Uh, to both report their, their full carbon accounting, and including their scope three emissions, and then to make a difference, to show progress on that. The place where they can make the most uh, progress is in their suppliers in developing countries that are using old technologies and haven't introduced any. And so for them, it is the exact place to put their money. And they can corral money, part of it's you know, government subsidized, part of it's philanthropy, part of it's impact investing, part of it's theirs. But they spend that money there and they get a huge reduction in emissions compared to if they spend it in Australia. So it's exactly your point. Yeah. Thank oh. you. I, I, by the way, I don't know why I was given sh a very short chair. And I don't else know how it is. I think I like the idea of not trying to create pressure inside a, a given country to achieve change which is against the run of the, the flow of the river in that country, but rather utilize existing incentives to transfer the actual implementation action to some other place where it can happen. So I like the idea that in a profit maximizing country like the United States with perhaps a strong current political bias, uh, impeding uh, aggressive climate action, reducing consumption, the, all, all the things. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that if you have a global market where US companies can burn all the coal they want here, but as long as they do something that creates incremental energy supply for the developing world, and therefore global on a global basis per capita uh, consumption of energy is less per unit of emissions, that's good for the global <coughs> commons, and everybody benefits. The US guys get to do the bad thing, but they get to do the bad thing in a way which generally benefits the common, uh, the common goal. So I like not trying to change selfishness, I like to channel selfishness. I'd like to channel selfishness in a way which creates a common result and a good. That okay? sounds very behavioral. Yeah. So yeah. It's not, it's not, it's, this is not behavioral change. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is giving current behavior a chance to express itself in a way which benefits the group. I'll give you an example of that, a brief one. You know, the Inflation Reduction Act which is something of a misnomer, uh, <laughs> is really a huge climate bill. And it had a lot of opposition from the members of the Republican Party. The states in the United States, which are now reaping the greatest business and economic benefits from that bill, are controlled by Republican legislatures and governors. They are the ones, whether they admit it or not, who are now benefiting the most from the incentives to bring in large industries and big businesses into their states. At a certain point, if only privately, that might just change their minds to some degree. It has certainly changed their behavior, actually. 
Michael, you have the, the, the smile of someone who's saying to myself, I pity the unenlightened. No, 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 <laughs> not at all, not at all, not at all. No, I totally agree. And to, um, to Jim's point too, like this is, this is almost, almost like a political economy point, right? Is that you're essentially, you with this, with this kind of shock, this one change that, that got through, you're creating a, um, political coalitions that will support, you know, we think, we hope, maybe, more likely to support continue, um, uh, yeah, the, continue the transition. Um, uh, at least, yeah, maybe it's reducing the opposition in terms of the, the invested interest in those places. Um, but I, no, I think I'm, you know, all for enlightened self-interest. Um, I would just, to Jim's point, actually, I would just say that, you know, another part of behavioral economics is uh, what we call other regarding preferences, right? So, and we often discount this in the study of economics. We focus on what people you know, would rationally do to maximize their individual self-interest in terms of financial rewards. That's sort of you know, 90% of economics. Um, but I think you know, that downplays the extent to which we as, as humans uh, care for each other and care for the next generation, our children, and, um, and, f and f have a moral identity. And invoking that moral identity is incredibly important. And, and um, dismissing that moral identity and introducing market norms, I mean, this is what Michael Sandel has written about extensively, um, you, that's very uh, dangerous. Uh, so there's a lot of areas of our life that are governed just by what we think is our moral identity and what is right and appropriate to do in that. And it's not affected at all by individual you know, self-interest. If you think about littering, um, what are the chances of getting caught and fined littering, especially in the rural, in rural areas? When I was growing up in a rural Australia, everyone littered on the highway. Everyone, there was no social norm saying you don't do that. Um, same with cigarette smoking, you know, in, in small rooms, everyone did that too. Now, that is definitely not acceptable behaviour, um, and it's not because you're getting a chance of being fined. It's because we all accept that that it, there's something wrong with that behaviour. And uh, you're outside the group, you're another, if you're doing that um, these days. And that is a really important um, uh, guidelines or, or you know, um, uh, safeguards basically around, around behavior that's been you know, a huge change just in my lifetime. Um, and I think it reflects a sense of what's right less than it does a sense of self-interest. But what was the sense of what was right nascent and then, then actualized by something? Or what, was it a sense that got seeded, came, came to growth slowly. Yeah, it's a hot, I mean, on that one, like litter, I, I teach you a little bit on the litter one just because it's, um, you know, in most places, I think it was a gradual absorption of di di new ideas uh, about what's right and wrong in terms of how we are stewards for our environment. Um, but there's one case where it was a sharp change, probably people know this case, and that is in Texas with the Don't Mess With Texas anti-litter campaign. That, that slogan comes from a, the Department of Transportation's anti-litter campaign begun in the 1980s in Texas. And it was like an ad guy given the commission, he didn't know what to say at the last minute. He said, oh, how about this? Don't mess with Texas. And uh, they rolled that out, highway signs, billboards. They had Dallas Cowboy footballers on TV saying, don't mess with Texas. And, and they very quickly transformed the set of norms about what you you know whether it's okay to throw things out of the car on the highway in Texas to be an issue of state pride, right? which is a little bit of genius in that, right? You didn't convince young men in Texas to care about the environment. You made not littering about state pride, right? And that dramatically transformed um, that just that one state in terms of highway littering. So you know, there's I think we just have to not only limit ourselves to to self-interest and think about financial reward um, and financial costs, we can think about, to Jim's point, I think about you know, the moral vision here and how to engage it in a, in a broad way. And we've seen versions of it before in lots of areas of life. So. Diego. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, this, the optimal combination of moral imagination plus behavioral change and enlightened self-interest is perhaps one of the best things in my hand in the toolkit. But um, I'm a little bit concerned because for this toolkit to work, you need a certain degree of stability among the population. Uh, the same people you made the campaign one day is the people that are gonna have to change the behavior the next. And uh, 
we are going to be, well, we are facing a situation in which uh, not everybody's in Texas, not everybody's in Texas the next day and the year after. And, and in that context, we need to have a little bit of, a, of an adaptation of that framework. Uh, and uh, everything that is also related to moral imagination to the extreme also lends a lot of ammunition to extreme positions. And that I'm very concerned. In the case of a, of a political polarization, the same argument that I can that I can use for not littering in Texas can become, you know, I let yeah. you all you imagine yeah. what can that be. So it's important to keep that in mind. I think we have time, given that the past 20 minutes have been the response to the first of the public questions. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question before we close for the uh, uh, for for the next break. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Brooke Suter. Um, so this idea of trauma and the idea of trauma igniting action, um, what I think about with regards to that is trauma igniting inaction uh, and the fear response and the contraction and the tightening of um, the ability to think um, in a generative kind of way and move just towards a survival mechanism. Um, and one of the things I particularly like about the Don't Mess With Texas example is um, some way to give people uh, a, a focus forward. And I think the degree to which we can find not a Pollyannish point of view, but um, ways to talk about the action that's needed, um, really connecting with something that helps people move out of trauma towards action. Um, and I also wondered if any of the, the folks on the behavioral insights side of things had seen any research around um, to your point about it being sort of a gradual change, um, <laughs> I wonder if there are sort of, uh, you have one trauma, you have one event, and you can sort of discount that as a one-off. Then you experience a second event, and you start to go, hmm. And then maybe you experience a third event, and then you're like, oh, shit. So I'm wondering if you've seen any evidence of that, um, because I know I think a lot of people were, were pretty horrified after Sandy, yeah. and then all of a sudden everyone kind of ignored it, and then floods in Houston, and then oh, everyone ignores it, and then uh, it's, it's just sort of stunning to a, a lot of us how these things are completely discounted after the fact. So um, just curious about some of those things, and understanding we're not all rational. What does it take to really get down through the different layers for someone to have it be part of the identity and a willingness to change? Uh, it's a tough one. Um, I don't think there's any, not that I'm aware of at least, any specific research on the, you know, uh, sequencing of events, especially extreme weather events. You know, we, we've, um, we've done some research in Australia from um, a panel study that has uh, was a longitudinal study. So we have, we have people in the in the study that have, you know, been through severe drought severe heat, um, bushfire, and severe flooding. And so, you know, we, and, but all of them are sort of uh, at this point, um, uh, you know, in the 90 to 95% climate change is the most important issue uh, sort of bucket. Um, I think we, you know, I haven't seen a study that sort of looked at whether or not there's in some places with some, you know, perhaps more extremist messages on the other side pushing back saying we've always had extreme weather weather's always been going you know if we'd had had they'd had more exposure to those other kinds of communications would they have made the change to in terms of their attitudes and uh, um that the one that these people have in australia it's an interesting question um Other tra like the other transformations of beliefs, basic beliefs about political issues that we've seen have been gradual. Like the one that comes to mind is um, uh, one that you know we talk about with stereotyping and um, and attitudes towards uh, female participation in the labor force and where it was in the, at the time of the Second World War when the government had to campaign uh, very actively to change stereotypes about women. The Rosie the Riveter campaign and the whole you know um, uh, push to have women into the workforce because it was necessary for the war effort was a huge change. But nevertheless, participation and the views about female participation in the, in the labor force <coughs> took decades to evolve to where they are now. Um, so it's a, you know, 
it's an interesting that you could think of that as a traumatic event when you know when like a huge change was needed and demanded um uh and subsequently there was no other events there was a gradual a gradual change but it took a long time for beliefs to change so i haven't seen direct evidence on it but it's an interesting one to explore for sure Aaron. Um, a couple of things, because I love the framing of trauma, and I think you're absolutely right to pinpoint. I think there is massive trauma, social, um, and it is perhaps not as well understood. So I agree with that. On Australia, what is fascinating for me is how much Australia is still a mining nation and how much emissions it produces per capita. If you look at those numbers, like the whole story about Australia flips on its head and you think, oh my God, this is an incredibly polluting nation. And if you listen to activists uh, who fight back against uh, mining projects, I mean, that they are undergoing serious trauma. So that, you know, it's not sort of like some kind of rosy story, but there's two historical examples, I think that are interesting. Uh, while the British ruled what was then United India, there were significant famines and there were millions of people who died. And this is uh, understood very well. Uh, Amartya Sen has written some about this also. But um, the history of famine in uh, the you know what used to be United India, which is now three sort of independent countries, is, is largely forgotten. People don't remember that actually this was something we experienced serious hunger. And all it gets coded in is maybe some stories that you hear from your grandmother or she heard from her grandmother, but there's no social response and there's no understanding of this was massive social national trauma. And this is what you know we, we can perhaps do with it as a response. So malnutrition stalks um, all of these countries, I mean, in some places it is as bad as sub-Saharan Africa, where we're looking at 40% malnutrition, especially in under five. So that history, you can say, of famine has sort of just disappeared from our collective memory and we don't understand. But the Dutch are a very interesting, positive example of how they dealt with their history of trauma during World War II and they suffered immensely also, especially under, you know, what was happening to them from Germany. Um, and they essentially went ahead and de decided that we are a very small landmass, we need to produce food, and they began to do it in completely different ways, to the extent that now people from around the world, especially the so-called developing world, go to Holland to study how the Dutch produce food and how they grow their food. So they took their famine history and they put it in how can we do this better on very small landmass. So there's fascinating, there's no one way, like why didn't India do it or why didn't it do it the way the Dutch did it? Um, but yes, can we learn from what the Dutch did? I think we can. Michael. Just on, uh, reminded me of another great example of reform in, in political history is uh, the reform of the the repeal of the Corn Laws mm -hmm. and in, in the UK in 1846, right? So it came after several bouts of the potato famine uh, to the point where the Tories, who were still, for economic reasons, like very much supportive of tariffs, um, were, were essentially, you know, like, what did Gladstone say? Like, to Cobden, like something like, you know, you, you must defend this because I cannot. You know, it was like essentially a moral issue to point, at that point. It's just like people are dying in the streets. It's like, you know, we can't continue with this policy anymore. Um, and that was a national trauma that had been experienced actually several times leading up to that point, um, led to a major reform. Um, Jim? Well, reactions to trauma do differ, and I think very often they differ on the basis of what institutions are in place to deal with them. For example, to take uh, Superstorm Sandy, which, had it gone on a slightly different track, would have hit Boston and flooded 25% of the city of Boston. Well, it hit New York City. New York City now has the most significant sea level rise storm flood plan of any city in the United States because of Superstorm Sandy. The residents of New York City may not realize that uh, and probably don't, but New York City is probably more prepared for rising sea level than, oh, say, certainly Miami or 
Norfolk, Virginia, or any number of other cities. So very often the reaction is at different levels, and you don't always uh, don't always see it. There is one school of thought that um, you actually have to see these things, not just learn about the suffering, and you have to to go through it. Um, I'm not sure. California seems to have a natural disaster almost every other week now. Um, whether it's an earthquake or a wildfire or wind gusts reported in the mountains yesterday at 145 miles an hour. Um, and, and 10 feet of snow predicted for Donner Pass this week. Well, yeah, I mean, which in some ways is good, but in other ways is quite wild. Mm -hmm. But, you know, somehow seeping into the California consciousness, if I could use that phrase, <laughs> <laughs> Has, has been a recognition that they are going to need to have more renewable energy. And they do have more renewable energy, and more and more every day. And they have faced the problems of storage, and they have faced the problems that they used to have rolling blackouts. And there are lots of minuses as well as pluses in some respects, but they as a state, along with some of the other Western states, are actually making very significant progress in ways that some other states aren't. And it may have in part to do with the wildfires and the droughts, and uh, all of which have different causes, including high tension lines and so forth. But they wouldn't have caught so much had the underbrush not been so terribly dry and so forth. So I think all my point about these events is that for better or worse, they can be catalysts for action. They aren't always. That's true. The, the Dutch had terrible floods in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, they, they just had massive areas of Holland got flooded in big storms in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't happened since because of their reaction to those massive floods. Mm -hmm. And they made sure that every kid had a Yeah. So on this positive note, panel, many thanks for your contribution. <laughs> Fifteen minute break, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.